So my name is Chandler. I uh, work on the product and design team at Guild Education here in Denver. Super excited to be here talking about a topic near and dear to everyone's hearts of all the times we've screwed up uh, in our past lives of trying to do things. Uh, the list is long uh, and pretty interesting. We're going to try and keep it focused on a couple topics today. Uh, goal here is about, a, call it a 30 minute um, panel uh, conversation um, and then some time for y'all to ask questions. Uh, we have three great panelists here today uh, who come from different versions of product backgrounds and other worlds before that. Um, so super excited to let them uh, kind of bring that alive. Before we jump in and do some introductions, we want to get to know y'all a little bit so that we know who we're talking to. Um, so if you are currently working in the role of a uh, developer, software engineer, someone who writes code that deploys on websites, please raise your hand. Cool, thanks. Um, any designers in the crowd? Any product managers in the crowd? Hey. Who does not carry one of those three titles or something similar to it? What do y'all do? Awesome. Other hands? I saw a few others. Is that it? All right, so that's helpful. Um, can you raise your hand if you've been doing your job for more than five years? Three years. Cool, thanks. Um, just help them make sure we calibrate that. Does that sound good? Any other questions we want to know about? Awesome. Um, so I'm going to let these three jump in and talk a little bit about uh, kind of their personal failures, but wanted to give a quick introduction uh, before we did it. <laughs> uh, so uh, starting actually right here on my left, uh, so Julia um, started her career as a middle school math teacher for Teach for America, uh, working down in North Carolina, um, and then moved into uh, various types of digital product management, marketing type roles. Came to Guild about a year ago uh, to join us and lead, lead our efforts uh, at Guild around search and discovery and kind of that initial conversation with users, uh, very similar to how a lot of e-commerce companies think about um, kind of that activation and conversion in the catalog. That's not actually what's on our bio, but I think I missed there. <laughs> yeah, so the, direct, the, the real answers were uh, worked at Red Ventures, uh, focused on bank rate for a while down there. I think there's probably some folks uh, potentially in this audience who worked on bank rate pre uh, Red Ventures, which would be interesting when it was up here. Um, and it's been a code for about a year. Um, Vin, um, failed electrical engineer, love this. Uh, turned failed designer in spite of having degrees uh, in both electrical engineering and design. <laughs> Strong. Um, turned mostly successful product manager. He does not have a degree in product management, nor does, I'm guessing, anyone in the room. Uh, he's built products and teams for consumer startups and enterprise companies. Uh, currently a senior product manager at Workday, where he spends most of his time trying to create systems that foster creativity and execution on the Workday Boulder team, uh, working on productivity products. And James... Somewhere in here. Here we go. Uh, so James and I actually met uh, six and a half years ago. He's one of the first people I met when I moved to Denver. Yeah. Um, we worked together at Craftsy at that point. Um, since then, James has had quite the journey, uh, most recently working at SendGrid for two-ish years um, in an infrastructure PM role. Uh, so when we worked together, I uh, was working on e-commerce and more front-end as well as supply-side management stuff has worked through a bunch of things. And so the hope uh, here with these three is that we can represent B2B, B2C, infrastructure, internal tools, all the different ways that we build technology to help people do things, um, kind of talk about that diverse set of perspectives. So with all that said, I want to let them each do their little failure intros. Hi, I'm Julia again. Um, Got to say, when CK asked me to be on the panel about failure, flattered to say the least. <laughs> like you said, I work with him at Guild on search and discovery products. I would say my biggest failure is in my last job, which was at Bankrate as the PM for our mortgage vertical. Um, I thought I had uncovered a massive opportunity to monetize our calculator traffic, um, which represented 80% plus of Bankrate's traffic, and we made next to no money off of it. Uh, so seeing as I found this big opportunity, I jumped through over a lot of the hoops that I would normally go through, um, skipped through some of the in-depth user research I would have done, slapped some brands onto our calculators, put a bunch of advertising placements, uh, and return visitors tanked overnight. Uh, I think we took a lot of missteps there, but the biggest one was misunderstanding why users were on the mortgage calculator and understanding that applying for a mortgage is a really long buying cycle and trying to get people to convert right away was a really poor decision. I too was flattered slash called out when <laughs> CK asked me to be on the panel about failures. Um, 
I think my favorite one is uh, when I was on the more on the front end side, and we were building a loyalty program. We thought and modeled and surveyed that there's a multi million dollar revenue opportunity there to turn one time customers into repeat customers. And what it ended up becoming was a multi thousand dollar realization after four and a half months of development. Uh, so that didn't quite pan out as well as we hoped. Uh, hey, yeah, I'm back. Um, I tried to pick an example that was the furthest away from, in time from now so that I could articulate it because um, I self reflected on this and I thought I failed on that particular project over 100 different ways. So, yes. um, I was working in a startup in India about 11 years ago as um, part of the UX team then. We were competing against Facebook. Uh, to get traffic in India, so you know, spoiler alert on how this ends up. Um, and we were competing against them, and we had a feed, and we looked at MySpace as well, and we thought the best way to get people to look at other people's profiles and feeds is if we did some research and thought, okay, what does Facebook not have right now? Very rich personal media content. What does MySpace not have right now? Good recommendations. And we thought if you put both of those two things together, Clearly, two plus two equals five, right? So we put it together, and I mean, it was just like a colossal failure. Like, people, not only did our traffic die, people left, would give us angry reviews, <laughs> refused to come back. So, that's in the top three. That's a <laughs> so, don't need to pass it back. Um, so, next, we're going to jump in and talk to a little bit about, we just kind of had some surprises there, but talk a little bit more about things we thought were pretty sure bets that really just didn't hit it. So um, if each of you can go a little deeper either on what you were just talking about or something else, ideas that failed or surprised you as we took from the market. Sure, so one of the reasons that surprised uh, us about that is because we did a lot of qualitative research, did a lot of quant as well, did a lot of A-B testing, and we did pretty good like numbers on both. Um, we didn't do a lot of complicated quant testing, like correlation matrices and writing complicated models, we didn't do any of that stuff. Um, but we, one of the signature reasons we failed is that we noticed people would not, they would come to the content page, but then they would immediately drop off. They would not sort of sign up for the site. So we were kind of perplexed as to, well, we're getting a lot of hits on the page, on the landing page, but no one signing up. Then we realized that we had sign in and sign up on the top right. And most of our traffic, about more than 50% of the people, English was not their first language. So we saw sign in and sign up, but really a lot of people were confused. A lot of people went to sign in and then exited the page. But this blended in with the data we already saw of people trying to sort of sign in but forgot their password or whatever. We didn't get that, so the data was sort of edited there. Um, we, did, we interviewed one person who said, I'm confused between sign in and sign up. And at that point, it was like 2 in the morning, and we were like, you know what, let's just change sign up to register. Like, how about that? It's semantically the same thing, but visually, they're very distinct, and our registrations started just going up like that on the next day. <laughs> and we were like, oh, we spent all of this money researching, and all we have to do is just find a thesaurus. <laughs> I'm going to jump topics. Do it. Well, I'm going to jump examples anyway. Um, so in my current role, it's uh, in internal tools and platform. And we spend a lot of time trying to help our internal customers move faster. And at SendGrid, we have just an absolute crap ton of data. Uh, we have a lot of people who use the data and need quicker ways to get at the data. And so we're starting to figure out what is a better way to access some of this data for our internal business analyst folks. Uh, spent a lot of time digging in, trying to understand with some consultants, Really, like, what's the best schema for this data, for the queries that we're generating ad hoc, and the reports that we're running for this particular audience who really needs fast access to the data? Spent months and some ridiculous amount of money doing that, and had a proof of concept that worked great. It was like an eighty percent or eight time improvement in query speeds. We're like, this is awesome. This this is going to be great. Customers loved it. We loved it. It was going to be simple to turn around and implement in production, and we did. It, we, we had one small win. We decided we're going to do this for one customer's data first, instead of migrating all the data over to this new schema, which thankfully we did, because it turns out it's slower than the old way to do it once you get to scale. And so that was surprising for me. It was surprising for the engineers. It's like, oh, this proof of concept that you totally vetted, turns out once you actually throw a crap ton of data at it, it all falls apart. 
Yeah, so I think a good example on my part is probably four years ago is when I started in my first product slash digital marketing role. Um, and I think I made a mistake that a lot of new product managers do where I was chasing shiny features um, and not what was truly solving our users' problems. Um, and two things I loved when I was thinking about designs were carousels uh, and <laughs> um, And I wanted to slap them on just about every landing page I helped design. Um, and I think it was just a really good learning experience for me that just because something is interesting and shiny does not mean that users are going to react well to it. Um, and I think there are a lot of things out there that we might identify as best practices that actually don't perform well when you put them in front of users. Um, so it's just a good check-in for me early in my career that we should always be solving problems, uh, not putting features out there just because they look cool. <laughs> and Venice scroll is such a fun one. I'm guessing a bunch of people in the room have been through that in different lives. But there was this huge theory, right, of coming out on the backside of news feeds. We just had to keep feeding people content. It didn't matter if it was commerce or content or anything. Just keep feeding it, it'll go better. No one bothered to measure it. We just rolled it out everywhere. And um, we had a big realization back in my craftsy days that, uh, so we, we deployed that, um, got rid of pagination, because no one wants to click through this really in the way, uh, and saw like a 25%. Do you remember what it was, Matt? Or James? I don't remember. It was, it was, it was terrible. Um, and we just should have measured that. So that actually takes me a little bit to what we want to talk about next, a little bit. How do we vet ideas? Um, James talked a little bit about how do we start to de-risk through prototypes and things like that. We could still be wrong there. But want to get deeper and probably actually spend a lot of this talk on how do we think about understanding what might or might not be successful uh, so that when we are doing investments, so that when we are taking things fully, um, we're more likely to actually have returns on it. Um, so the first topic we want to jump into there is uh, ultimately when we're trying to vet things, we have to know what works, right? That's the like the, the goal of all of this. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about what work means and how we think about setting that and identifying that in different products. So with that as the prompt, anyone want to jump in on what does work mean in our products? One thing we'd love to do is uh, set a couple of criteria. So if we're looking to improve something, we don't just say we're going to improve it because especially for internal stuff, that can turn into a rabbit hole and you never come back out of it. You can just keep iterating and iterating and iterating. So we'll set, like, we need a 10% improvement. If we get to eight, we're gonna iterate on it for another two sprints. If we only get to four, we're gonna leave it as is and just move on to the next problem. If we get to 12, great, crushed it. And then we're moving on to the next problem as well. So setting those thresholds of wh where do we wanna get? What happens if we get there or just miss or get beyond has been really helpful in understanding like not only where do we want to get and trying to figure out what to do in the first place, but then after we do that, then what do we do? So that we don't turn those projects into never ending projects. Uh, had a pretty similar answer to James. Um, so thinking through what you do next, uh, once you determine kind of what that threshold is for success, um, probably anybody who's read any sort of product book has heard the 90-10, 80-20 rule, where you can generally find 80% of the value in a product with 20% of the effort. So I think it's really important investing early on in what that 20% effort is to figure out if you're delivering the value to your customers, um, whether that's through prototypes and Envision, which you can partner with your design team on and get up and running on something like usertesting.com really quick, um, or working with engineers to slim down an initial V1 and get it out there quickly to learn how users want to engage with it before you invest in the bells and whistles and getting that incremental 20%. So I'd just like to add to that is when you see data sometimes qualitatively uh, or rather quantitatively, you're looking at a person performing a series of tasks that you've been applying some kind of mathematical like meaning to. Um, when you look at qualitative research, it's usually people recollecting a series of activities that they did. They don't, people don't think like computers, so they don't think of their life in a series of actions, like a sequence, right? So for people recollecting, well, some people do, I guess. <laughs> but um, for a lot of people, really, recollecting an action that they did is an impression of their memory. And the way you try to sort of consolidate the qualitative and the quantitative research is trying to figure out, okay, what is the impression this person had of their action, and how does that map to the holes that we see in our data, and what questions are there? Usually those kinds of like in-between areas will tell you where to find the emotional validation for the user. And really when I think we mean solving a customer pain, it's not just them completing a task, it's really like talking to them and 
hearing that sort of sigh of like relief with. And I think that's how I would look at both sides of that and how you blend that together to see what works. And then work with these guys so just figure out what's next. So to kind of go to the other end of that, talk talk to us about a time when you did all those things, you validate it, and it's gonna be end of you brought it to market. And then it didn't work on the other side, and you had to decide whether you were going to kill it or keep it as a feature. I think we're all like structurally concerned with feature bloat in our products yeah. and the cost of maintenance. How, how do we how do we go through that life cycle? Yeah, so I think a lot of product people were taught that if you build something that's valuable and feasible, it'll work. Um, I think that's true most of the time. What happens is you build a feature, you think you're going to solve a customer's problem, but we fail to take into account what they think their relationship with the brand of the company is or what the product is, and more importantly, what their relationship with their competitors are and how that affects their relationship with us. That's very hard to measure. Like I've done countless experiments where I've vetted everything, spent more time than I needed to, used a larger sampling size, um, vetted it with a few people in-house in a focus group, and then went ahead and just tanked. Mainly because the way they perceived us was not how we thought they perceived us when suddenly they were forced to be in our world and use an action. So even in the same thing in that social network, we launched a music player and we put it in the feed and people were using it and then we found out that using and liking it soon went to extreme disdain very quickly. And then we were like, how did, how did that happen? And it turned out that they were like, I, I want my music in my space, I want my feed in Facebook. Somehow, I just don't see you guys that way. And how do you quantify a statement like that? <laughs> and we were like, oh, like, I didn't think of asking that in the feedback form. Like, so, yeah. <laughs> so, we bring products to market. Eventually, most of them have to die in some way. How do we make the choice to subset a product? If it sucks, right? I mean, no. <laughs> Hey, your, your users have a limited attention span and ability to focus, just like we do. And the more features you have out there that are kind of half working, the more you're distracting them from the stuff that is actually working. And so I think we as product managers, you have to look holistically at your product and say, well, what do we want them to actually do? What gets in the way of that or doesn't really accomplish that task? And how do we get rid of that? I mean, with internal tools and platforms, similar things happen. When there's a bloat of tools, you have an audience or customers, developers, who don't know what to use and lacking direction, they go figure it out on their own in methods that aren't necessarily optimal. Customers will do the same thing, usually by not using your product. So they'll go coupon clip somewhere else or buy an education somewhere else or buy crafty, crafty stuff somewhere else. So customers, are, that you gotta be, be sure you're cognizant of that limited attention span, I think. Yeah, I think the internal tools example is really interesting here as we all think about building products for our partners inside companies and kind of how we think about what features are we giving them? How are we thinking about enabling that? And what happens when we don't give them features? Um, do we want to enable those workarounds? Um, always a fun journey to think through that. Um, so I want to slightly transition us into, if we assume that most of the things we do kind of in, in our work on it won't work at the highest level, um, how do we think about finding the ones that will? So we've had some early touches on this around prototyping, around learning, things like that. Want to jump in a little bit deeper on especially qualitative methods to start. Um, so ways that we can better maybe understand those users or, or think about what might fit them. Yeah, I think at Guild in particular, we're really lucky. Uh, we have an entire student-facing team that speaks with our customers and users on a daily basis. Um, and that, for me, has been a really great starting point when we have an idea or a problem we're wanting to solve. Pulling in that student-facing team, pitching the idea to them, talking through the problem to really understand what problem we're solving and how those teams think our users will respond to changes we're proposing. Um, and then once we've done that in-depth research with student-facing teams, real students who we have pretty easy access to, user test um, I like to get something out there as quickly as possible to get some actual quantitative data on it. Um, I don't mean actual data, but quantitative data on it. Um, and I think there are some 
pretty easy ways to usually get to the answer you're looking for with very minimal effort. Um, an example recently from Guild is we are in the process of building kind of your classic e-com product recommendation quiz. Um, it's a huge build, uh, both from a design and engineering perspective. We've got a couple of <laughs> engineers in the room who are probably nodding their heads. Um, but we wanted to understand, is this a product our users even want? Um, and rather than just asking our users that, I wanted to get something out there pretty quickly. So in an afternoon, I built something on Typeform. It probably took three hours. It was super hacky, not a great flow. Um, but put it in front of our users to understand what percent of users are opting in, where are they dropping off, what is their sensitivity to questions like GPA and past college credits, um, and used a lot of that data to inform how we built the real thing. Um, so a few weeks out from the actual launch, I feel a lot more confident about a lot of the features because we were able to get them in front of real live users after just a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm personally a huge fan and probably overuse uh, because it's shiny and weekly, uh, user story mapping and trying to start to slice off not really required tasks to get down to really the MVP. Um, and then fortunately with internal tools or platform, you can go ahead and talk through that high level outcome that you're driving through with the developer and say, I think you're gonna do this step and this step and this step and this is what, we'll, what you'll get at the end of it. And I think that that solves your problem. Can, can you tell me about why it doesn't or how it could be better? Um, so just using that as an artifact, because you can come up with it with some sticky notes and a whiteboard in 20 minutes and drag some developers in from their ping pong game and <laughs> you know validate internally. Um, but again, it's getting it in front of the customer and doing it as fast as you can to get that, that rapid feedback. I think is really valuable in figuring out what is the first thing that you can put out there to a broader audience. I just want to add something to that. I think echoing the story mapping idea, increasing the story mapping to outside of your product. Because a lot of the times the journey starts outside of your product, doesn't even start at your product, right? So maybe the MVP is some sort of a transition that comes out of the journey outside your product and comes in. So like I'm an enterprise company and I lead product for a presentation style software. So like things like PowerPoint or slides, but you find it doesn't matter if it's using data. And when we did a story mapping, we found out that we're the last mile of like every user journey there is in our company. Nobody like is going to pay millions of dollars because they're going to use another presentation software that's different. So we're like, we just got to like get rid of that, you know, the ego that we have about the product. So the MVP that we did was, what are the, all of the things people are doing before they got into a product? They're in spreadsheets, they're in various things. So maybe the MVP is getting them to figure out what's the easiest way to get their data from the spreadsheet into our product. We didn't even have to mock anything up with our product. We just mocked up a file transfer into like a window that is our product. And that was like our MVP that we validated. We knew that the moment we saw that customer pain, customers would be more forgiving with the rest of the MVPs that we like have. So I would just extend the story mapping on every product because that works well. I want to talk for a second about uh, quantitative uh, AB or multivariate testing as kind of one leg of the stool. Um, can y'all talk through uh, kind of how your companies in, in current or past lives have thought about running experiments um, and what that meant? So what, what was kind of the lead up that got into that? How did you make sure things were ready? Uh, and then what sort of things did you actually validate through that as a methodology? I think often in the market, we this becomes like the answer to how do you learn what, what succeeds or fails? And so I want to like, yeah, just talk through more about how do you think about balancing that? So, so given that you quantitative is a, is a tool we have, where are the right times to use it? How do we think about using it? Yeah. Um, I had an answer anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I spent some time at Home Advisor, and we extensively used A/B tests um, through what we call the SR path, service request, um, trying to ensure that customers actually finish that flow and get all the way to submitting their request so that bids go out to contractors or handymen or plumbers, whatever it might be. And so we lived and died by the AB test, um, did it all the way through the SR path. And it, it makes sense when you're testing one thing at a time where you can definitively say your AB test had an impact. But if you start to stack, and we ran into this time and time again as multiple teams are trying to test things, when you start to stack things together, you can lose track really quickly of what's actually impacting the, the end journey of that customer. And so for us, it was really important to coordinate across the teams and understand who was running tests when. But given the volume, we're able to get to statistical relevance or, yeah, I think 
was right. Close enough. Um, <laughs> statistically relevant results fairly quickly um, with a pretty small percentage of our traffic. And so then once you have a winner, you can flip that live through a feature flag. And it was just, it was part of the platform and it made those experiments in that part of the journey really simple. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, I'll piggyback off of what he was saying about making sure you're able to really isolate what is driving the incremental mental performance, because I think that's one of the biggest failures when we're launching A-B tests, is testing too much at once. Um, and you can say experience B outperformed experience A, but unless you're able to say, here's why, uh, I don't think of it as too much of a success, because you're not able to replicate it, and I think that can oftentimes lead to pretty disjointed product experiences. Um, so one thing that I've just learned over the years is to really make sure every test has a really strong hypothesis behind it. Not, people aren't clicking, let's make that button orange. Um, but digging into why we don't think they're clicking through and designing an experience that we really feel confident about and have a hypothesis as to why it will drive the lift in performance. Um, and making sure that even though you are excited to rule 12 things out at once, um, even if you do do that, which with small volume businesses, I do think it can make sense, as long as you have the right analytics in place and the right investigative metrics in place to understand how users were interacting with that new experience and what actually drove the elective performance. I was going to say the story mapping thing actually comes in here too, because that way you can map out which part of the journey you're actually going to be testing, and you're not conflicting it with other A-B test results that you're getting. And also having like an A-B testing vision strategy, someone who has an umbrella of the problem that you're trying to solve, and then every A-B test is working towards that solution, not working towards like a solution in isolation of that specific problem. And I think that's usually where people get hung up is they don't look towards the end solution. And if you story map stuff, you're like, okay, the solution is, how do I get this person to the next stage of their journey? And that usually helps everyone sort of align in the way that they do test because you can get paralyzed when you conclude that stuff. About 10 years ago, most of this would have had to be done follow or quant in very manual ways, homegrown ways, things like that. Uh, over the last 10 years, untold tools have come on the market. I'd love it if each of you could talk about one favorite tool of the moment uh, for right now that is bringing uh, new energy or new approaches into your fall or quant investigative lives. All right, I'm going to nerd out here. Just for a second. So um, I am in no way endorsed by this company. I just want to find out. Uh, so Amplitude um, is a company that was trying to get pretty big. They have they use Segment to get all of the events from your website. Um, I highly encourage people who are starting like new businesses and new ideas to try out. I think they have a free trial period for a while. Um, the reason I like them is not only do they give sort of all of the data modeling capabilities, really pretty charts and multiple user collaboration, but they have started adding things to it, which is like story dump. So the most important part I think is not just getting the data and all these tools, like helping you uh, even customize like your statistical modeling on the software itself, because usually with other things, you got to take it out in Excel, make all these complicated models, and bring it back and see how the chart looks. They do everything in-house, but they have something called a storytelling kind of software, which is you have all of these charts with various AP tests that you've done, and you can concatenate each of these charts together and then form a narrative that you're trying to say, like you're trying to tell. So instead of having a PowerPoint deck with like each slide being a different chart, you can have a story that you just send to people, and you're like, my story is, I'm trying to figure out how I can get this person through our shopping cart experience. And the story has like a structure and area where you can pull charts of the person coming to the landing page, going to the cart, adding their credit card number. So it's such an easily digestible way for people to look at data and how A-B testing works that I feel like it helps stakeholders, and by that I mean upper management, um, get sort of more focused along with the people running the tests as opposed to being like, I don't like blueberry 300 blue, I want raspberry you know. So it's much more helpful to communicate as well, which I think is as important as getting the data. So amplitude. I feel like I should get a t-shirt. Give this man a t-shirt. Um, not as cool, probably, but optimizely uh, is what we use pretty extensively for really rapid uh, front-end tests to get away from the homegrown platform uh, at HomeAdvisor and that two-week delivery cycle that we had. Um, it was great for product managers and our web designers to get in there and mess around with layout if that was something that we were testing, trying to change that user journey towards an outcome. Optimizely, it was going to be mine as well. Um, one super niche product that I've loved mostly in past roles is actually called iQuant, um, which you can put an experience in it and it'll tell you 
uh, how users will scan through it with their eyes um, and what's going to grab their attention. And I think it was just a really I kind of stopped using it because I felt like I learned so much from it. I now have a good sense for how users interact with pages um, from an information hierarchy perspective. But it's really cool and pretty low cost. You could just throw a screenshot in there and it'll give you heat maps as to where they're looking in what order. I'm going to throw one in here too. Um, we use Full Story um, extensively at Guild, and it's been one of those tools that um, we actually use it a lot for like re figuring out what's wrong and reacting to it. Um, but it has closed in our learning cycles uh, and let us run. We're, I don't know, somebody called me on this, something like 70 ish uh, developers, PMs, designers these days, something around there. Um, we have no QA. Um, and the reason we've been able to get away with that for a long time is that we catch things that are wrong really fast and can turn around and fix them. And so we've used full story, like probably to the end of its abilities. In app. Yeah, I can talk forever on that one. Um, one kind of like related thing that all of you have gotten into a little bit, but want to talk a little bit about differences in B2B versus B2C or not differences as we think about trying to validate products. It could be the same. And you can all just say, go away, don't ask this question. <laughs> I'm talking a lot. Um, so the B2B thing, I think one of the traps I fell into earlier in my career of doing finding the difference and trying to translate like B2C experience is okay, like what uh, let's say my customer or my user is a guy working in a company who has his own user, right? So I try to kind of empathize with the person who's my immediate customer and then extend the sort of empathy towards his customer and try to solve for both at the same time. Because I thought, oh well, he's really our customer, but who's the end user of this journey? It's his customer. So why don't we get both and try to solve those problems? And I feel like not only was it just, it didn't work, but it was a very condescending way to sort of talk to your customer in a B2B platform and tell him that I sort of also have an equal say or have a better idea than you do over how to solve this problem for your customer. And he would very rightly reply, that's sort of not your problem. I'm paying you money, my customer's not paying you money, right? So focusing in on specifically our customer's problem and really nailing down how their org works. I think it had very less to do with the product that they were using and how their organizational structure works. So right now at Workday, we sell ACM software and financial analytics. So when we think of flows, it's we don't go to a company and say, oh, this product is valuable, it's feasible, and you can use it. We're like, okay, how, what's your relationship like with your management? Like, do you use the product? Do you have full autonomy in the things that you do? Um, do you have weekly stakeholder meetings? Because that varies from like company to company. So I would say, unlike a B2C and a B2B, you really have to dig into that person's working environment, that person's org structure, that person's rhythm of meetings, their daily schedules, and really nail down how to help, how to help them solve that problem, and not really just the product experience part of it. I think you started to touch on there a little bit, but especially in B2B, you have your your user and you have your buyer. And if you're in a large B2B org, a lot of your internal stakeholders are starting to get the buyer, not the user. And so starting to tease out those use cases and how you have to talk to sales or marketing or whoever it is about both of those audiences and what problems you're going to solve for can be wildly different. And understanding how internally that customer is talking between the buyer, the person with the ultimate checkbook responsibility, and this person who's actually using the software. Um, that, that can be a tricky relationship to, to handle. And it's not necessarily one that you have in a B2B, or B2C rather, sorry, uh, environment where that person is the buyer and the user most of the time. So at Guild, our user is not our customer. Um, just nothing super unique, um, but I've kind of felt the tension mostly in how I set my roadmap. Um, so it's not going to be purely driven based on product first initiatives. There's also the pull of what our customers are asking for. Um, and I think it's really easy to want to dedicate swim lanes to each of those. So what are the updates we need to make from a business perspective? What do we truly want to do for our users? Um, and I think it's really important. And what I've been trying to do more of is actually making those two priorities compete against each other. So taking into account the B2B requests and what we believe is best for our users, how do we set a roadmap to accomplish both of those things and making sure that it's a unified experience without you know kind of making both of those updates in parallel so that was most of what we wanted to cover in kind of this broader session and wanted to turn over some time to y'all to ask questions about everything from we spent a bunch of time on kind of testing frameworks and validation frameworks uh, to failures uh, 
And so, Q and A time. Any questions from the room? Yes, how do you guys? Uh, are there any sort of like books, podcasts, these sort of things? I don't have really any experience in any product or UI UX, but certainly very interested in it. I know there's like a million different ways to go. Anything that stood out to you guys that you enjoy or like or so the question was books, podcasts, learning type things that are really great around these topics. There's a ton of A-B testing books out there. Um, the Optimize Lead blog is really great uh, for running A-B tests. I'm sure I've already forgotten. Amplitude. Amplitude probably has a great blog. I space now. Just trying to remember Optimize it. Um, and there's literally a book written about user story mapping by Jeff Patton that is a really great intro into that and validation of problems. If you had to read one book inspired by Marty Kagan, like I'm sure everyone would echo that. But if you had to read one book, that's it. Really, I would spend a lot of time reading non-product things like behavioral economics, just generally economics, um, how pricing works, um, political science books on how team chemistry works, how team dynamics work. How to foster collaboration. So I would do like an 80 20 with 20% product, but 80% everything has nothing to do with product management. Yeah, I agree with everything um, they put out there. I think biggest learning for me has just been from people <laughs> in the industry, whether it's other PMs or engineers or designers, and I've learned the most from picking their brain on questions I have or things that I'm trying to develop on that I know they're really good at. Um, so I would just encourage you to reach out to people in your network. I think the other thing I'd push is, we didn't really get into it today, but some a lot of this is being comfortable with failing and accepting that we're not going to do everything the right way. Um, and I actually think how I built this, um, Guy Ra has a great podcast around this, trying to get into some of the people we would think of as the most successful founders out there, all the ways what they tried to do went wrong um, and almost didn't work. And most of them came out the other side, and that's great, but lots of really good stuff inside there to hit one, at least one podcast for this. Other questions? Um, so let's say you're competing for a job for a client and they have specific users for your application. Uh, and you want to do your best for the client as well as your users. How do you roll that into the next How do you roll outside of the business wants and also provide more to your users? It's a great question. I'm not sure anyone up here has material agency experience to answer that from a pricing perspective, but let's think about it. Let me try and, so the question was, you're competing for a job, um, and you want to make sure you're not just doing what the client asked for, but also what's the right user choice. Uh, is that a fair synopsis? Um, let's reframe that slightly for this group and say, let's imagine we're going into a B2B environment. We, uh, we have a client that exists, um, and they're pushing us for either an improvement to something they want, or we're trying to push them to say, well, but all of your users need this thing. How do you have that conversation? That'll work too. <laughs> so I was a freelance designer for a long time, and um, uh, I have a pretty um, amoral answer to that, um, which is when I was desperate to look for jobs, I would do what's right for the customer. When I had money and I could refuse jobs, I would try to do what's right for the user. That's it. <laughs> Sorry, it's not more sophisticated. <laughs> I, I, I actually think the answer to the version of the question I asked wouldn't be that different. Yeah. If I were thinking about how we, we did, so like early, early days guild, we had some idea of some things that were really critical to what we would do. Um, so we have never compromised on things like how the economics of our business work, because that uh, ensures we're aligned with students and things like that. But a, a good amount of the features we built and the way we built those features um, was literally because it was dictated by the client. Um, and we would sit there and just say, uh, this is a small part of the broader journey that we're trying to accomplish. And as long as we think it's, yeah, that's bad design, but okay, whatever. Um, or yeah, that's a bad feature choice. We would have done this differently. But ultimately, we're getting to this global uh, perspective and place where we want to. We kind of. Uh, we still have a number of these live where we just said, yeah, whatever. Not the, not the, not the fight we're going to fight. Uh, the bigger one's more important. Uh, relative to what you mentioned about being comfortable with failing, um, a failed project has a lot of like tangible impact on the business just in terms of like hours, money spent, etc. But also there's like the intangible uh, impact, like on the team, team morale, stuff like that. Um, how do you guys like talk to your team? Failure and, and uh, keep morale high after something like that. That's a great question. So, 
uh, repeating the question for the back. Um, given that there's obvious tangible and cost impacts of failure, um, there's also a ton of intangible ones, largely around team morale and how we approach our work. Um, how do we think about talking as a team uh, about those sorts of things? Oh, good, now it's an agile panel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, my favorite thing is pull the team in, make them stakeholders. Um, get them involved in defining how they're going to go solve the problem. Uh, you're going to get a really demotivated team whether your project is successful or not if you dictate to them what to go build. I assume you would agree. Um, if you involve them in what we're going to go build to solve this problem, regardless of how it goes, then they're going to be much more invested. And if you're giving them the authority or empowering them to do the measurement along with you and see that success as it happens or failure, then they're going to potentially come up with a great pivot that you as a product person aren't going to think about because they're vested there in their day to day. So that's one way I found success in not making it a dead march. I think a lot of it is just about framing, especially at Guild, we're still pretty early on. So a lot of what we're doing is to learn. And as long as you're holding that as the key success metric, I think you can almost take as much of a step forward with a failure where you learn something really important as if it drove incremental conversion. Um, and I also just go back to making sure whatever you're putting out there is not necessarily the slimmest version, but an MVP, um, and making sure you're limiting risk as much as possible. So if you can run quick tests to validate some of your ideas before investing in a massive build, um, you limit the chances of that happening, but I think a lot of it's about framing regarding what you learned and how you're gonna move forward. I just want to add something to that, which is a lot of times people think that a product manager is someone who's managed. If you're focused on the product, then that's all you need to do. But really, you're a silent leader. It's more about product leadership on any level if you're a product manager, whether you're a junior product manager or a senior product manager. So if you can take opportunities before that to celebrate all the wins as well, you're setting the team up to know how to deal with failure as a group. And that way, People don't think that it's on them because a lot of times when you work with engineers, they feel like they're holed up or they're isolated in the problem solving. And when they fail, they feel like either they did something wrong or if only someone had told me what the right thing to do is, I could have done it and I could have helped. So I think celebrating the successes and creating a psychological safety as a leader, as a team. And a lot of ways you can do that is every time there's even small sort of product failures, you own up to it as a product manager and be like, I screwed up. I'll go and try and fix it, and I need your help. And the more you do that and set up the safety that when you fail, I feel like the framing becomes easier to do because people trust that you're framing things in the best intentions and not just doing it as a form of emotional validation and then like your retro becomes like this group therapy session. You know? So I feel like it starts all the way from before. Like, it's like an everyday thing from stand-ups to spread by. A lot of the questions and answers so far have been sort of from your individual perspectives as product managers and how you interact with your teams. I wonder if your answers are different at all when you start to think about what types of, like at a higher level, the organizations that have then made you more or less successful or what types of environments um, have put your product. So this is a great question. We've been talking a lot about uh, local within teams. How do we think about this? Um, question here is what are the environments um, at a global level that have made you more or less able uh, to be successful. This will be really curious. I've worked closely with a couple of them. So it's fine. <laughs> um, I think team culture. And you see a lot of companies trying to hire, they have team values and um, sussing that out in the interview process, seeing how serious they are about their values and the work culture. Um, I feel like of Kind of after all these years, really for me, it's not actually about the product, it's really about the team. And I could go build like a freaking sewage system for Denver if I know that the team I'm working with is fun. They'll be like super interesting to me. Because so I think that it's really the work culture. And if you're interviewing anywhere for a job, that's where you should suss up. Like the product part of it is a rocket science, right? Like most people can like figure this out, it's not like hard. It's really the team culture. In the interview, you if all your questions are framed in the interview process about how they solve conflicts and conflict resolution. That will sort of elucidate the process they take in disagreeing with each other and how they do that. So I would heavily focus on culture. And places I were worked at where feeling didn't feel as hard was where we trusted each other and it was just so much fun just hanging out with everybody that it didn't feel like high pressure. So for me, um, orgs where there's a shared vision versus a shared list of features we're going to build. 
has been much more empowering and delivery teams are a lot happier uh, because you're going out and getting towards that vision together. How you get there is kind of up to the team and you're going to measure your own success versus you're going to go build this thing and test colors to make sure you get the right version of it. And it's just a lot more empowering and I feel like I've been more successful and built more creative products uh, somewhere where you have more of a broad vision and you get to help have that same strategy than taking the orders from someone. So I'm actually going to answer this um, as a PM, uh, which I was for a while. Um, for me, it was always about when people frame things as problems to me. Um, and so this is a version of what's kind of been talked about. But any space where, uh, like, we're all, I think many of us are here because we like solving problems. We like solving technical problems. We like solving end users' problems, whatever it is. And so any org that thought that way, and you could see it through and through when you ask, what's your org design? How do you think about putting person here versus person here and, and kind of making those choices. When you start hearing them talk about, well, we need this feature added, um, you should understand that that likely means that environment that you're going into is going to be much more of a factory as opposed to an iterative discovery group. Whereas when people start to frame up, um, at one point I, I worked for a company where the question was, um, should we be, uh, when, when we're dealing with international travelers, um, should we be allowing them to use our product uh, without access to the internet. Uh, the actual global question that was asked before that was, why are we seeing holes in, in usage and consumption um, as people leave their home markets? Um, and for it was when I was at TripAdvisor, and there, like that journey was all about, uh, eventually led us to a feature that was, how do we build offline things? Um, and how do we let people work uh, without access to those things? But we also explored big roaming partnerships to allow people to get there on their own, and all these sorts of global things inside the organization that we tried, um, because the question was about how do we solve the problem, not how do we build the future. Um, how are we doing on time? Uh, we can go for two and a half more minutes. One more question. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, you know, failures, that, uh, at least a couple of you mentioned at the, the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. A common thread was that you had a blind spot or that there was some bias in the way that you were answering or asking questions where certain questions weren't getting asked to your users of testing. How have you each grown in your roles to shrink those blind spots and um, you know, deal with your own personal biases? So assuming that we all have personal biases that we bring to the table, how do we get over that? How do we grow from all that? Is that a fair summary? Uh, yeah. Great. Um, that's a great question. I feel like you can't. <laughs> so you just trust, you get better at trusting other people to do it for you, covering your own biases. I feel like you can get into a spiral of paranoia and product management insecurities if you start spending every waking hour trying to figure out what your subconscious biases are. It's just, it's, yeah, it's never ending. So I feel like getting better at communicating to other people the problems that you have and really good at framing questions to your team in a way that will cover for biases that you think. Bring more people into the conversation around what is the what's the problem we're trying to solve? Why do we think this is the right solution? Um, and then building to quick prototypes that validate those risks or prove out hypotheses that are risky before you build the whole thing that is something I've taken away. Yeah, I think those are great answers. I don't think you ever get rid of that. Um, and I think the reason why a lot of PMs follow the exact same process is because it works. Um, and I found that every time I think I'm smart enough to jump through a few of the steps is when I'm failing. Um, and it's just helpful to remind myself of that every time I have a new project that I think I know the user. Um, I've been working with them for a while, but every single time I learn something new and making sure I'm really following that process I've set out for myself. Great answers. Thank you all for being a great audience. Thank you to our three panelists for joining us.